I, what, one thing that I've thought about is, you know, on a high level is a feedback loop where today, you know, even GPT-4, though it's pretty good, it's not hugely useful to AI researchers that are developing, for example, GPT-5. It's somewhat useful. It probably helps them out a little bit with coding tasks, but it's not kind of doing most of the work by any means. It's doing a very small minority of the work. And so that's where we are today. And I sometimes kind of contrast that with the possible future we could end up in, where virtually all of the work of developing GPT-5, or I guess it would be all of the work developing, for example, GPT-7, is done by GPT-6. And the kind of big, the big change between those two scenarios is that in the second scenario, there's potentially quite a powerful feedback loop, where because it's the AI systems that are doing the work in developing the next generation of AI systems, then as soon as, you, as, soon as they've done that work and, and made an improvement, then your whole workforce of AI researchers is you know, significantly smarter. So if you imagine, just to make it very concrete, imagine GPT-2 trying to do AI research, it would be you know, absolutely hopeless. You can barely string a few sentences together. If you manage to get a step up, then now instead of GPT-2 doing all the AI research, you've got GPT-4, it's going to be you know, significantly more capable because it's just you know, much better across many, many tasks. And so if every year we had going from something like GPT-2 to something like GPT-4, and there was that upgrade in the research workforce, that could be quite a dramatic situation where just the kind of the quality of the workforce that is working on improving AI systems is just improving very, very, very rapidly. And so, so maybe what you're talking about is kind of mapping out how could that transition look like from a world like today, where kind of human researchers do all the work and AI systems are a little bit useful, but not that useful, to a possible future world where actually AI systems are basically doing all of the, the intellectual work involved in developing new AI. But, right, yeah, because I, I remember the, the particular podcast episode I heard you on, it was like, in the beginning, the humans would take very narrowly defined, well-specified tasks yeah. To, you know, basically, hey, GPT-4, we're going to go sleep for eight hours or whatever, <laughs> 10 hours, and come back in the office tomorrow morning. But overnight, can you look at, you know, and to give them a very specific, like, you know, try changing the parameter weights here and then use this external scoring guy that we, the humans, have developed to see is this an improvement or not and just try a bunch of stuff and we'll come back in the morning and see what you find or something. Yeah. But then maybe several generations later, it's more like, hey, GPT-9, we're going to go... uh do some other stuff for three weeks. In the meantime, try to improve yourself. Just whatever, <laughs> you know, and then we'll come back and give us a report as to what you, you know. So it's more open-ended that you're not picking where the advance is going to be that, it, you know. So anyway, that was kind of the, yeah. the, the evolution that you were describing. Yeah, so there's a few different dimensions you could think about. But one dimension is you could refer to as time horizon. That is, if you ask GPT-4 a single question, one sentence question, I think it's likely to give you a pretty good response most of the time. So, you know, sometimes I'm coding, I don't know what, what the right kind of code is to write in that next line. If I say, here's what I want to do, what's the code that will, will, that will achieve that thing? It's, it's really good at giving me that one line of code. But if I ask it, oh, could you, could you write 100 lines of code, then it's much more likely to get stuck at some point and make a mistake or yeah. misunderstand what I, what I intended. So one, one dimension we can imagine changing is that, you know, maybe at the beginning, AIs are used for very kind of short question, queries and questions, or like completing tasks, which would take a human something like one minute or five minutes. And so kind of humans are kind of always needed to kind of feed those questions into the AI system and then to get the answers out. And so, you know, the AI can't do much by itself. It's mostly the human kind of doing its work and occasionally getting the AI to help out. And then... Over time, the AI system gets smarter and it gets better at noticing its own mistakes, better at understanding human intentions. And so now you can give it a task that would take a human maybe half an hour. And so you say, okay, hmm, there's this, uh, I kind of want to deeply understand um, the trade-offs between developing it in this way or in that way. That's something I would normally go and kind of think away and do some research for half an hour to, to, to understand. I'm going to kind of ask my AI assistant to go and, to go and do that research for me. And it'll come back and it's able to kind of take those half an hour long tasks and do them. Or maybe it's writing out a kind of a test suite for some code that you've written and you can now trust your AI to kind of see the code and then understand the tests you want and write them out. And then over time, again, it gets smarter and it gets better at um, kind of operating autonomously. And then, you know, now you're able to give it a task that you would have given a kind of an assistant 
a whole day to do. And then later, you know, kind of a, a mini project that you would have given it a week to do. And so over time, it's kind of taking on these bigger and bigger chunks of work until eventually it's, it's able to do kind of whole projects like, you know, writing a new paper to publish in Europe so that would take a, you know, a small team of humans a few months. And at that point, you know, all the human is needing to do is, is maybe just kind of be trying to kind of keep up with what the AI system's doing and understand the work that's happening. But it, mm-hmm. you know, uh, increasingly, the human will just be kind of more reading and less kind of actively involved in the research pro- process. So that, that's kind of one dimension that you can mm-hmm. imagine. Right. Not enough. Um, and you can call that horizon length or kind of the task length in terms of time duration. And then another, I think another dimension, which is interesting to think about, is, is often called sample efficiency in machine learning literature. But it essentially refers to how many times has the AI seen a very similar problem to this in its training experience. And so currently, AI systems are very good when they've seen lots of examples of a problem. So if you ask the AI system, for example, how, whether, whether it can prove that um, there is no largest prime number, then it's seen that proof a thousand times when it was being trained. And so it can you know, explain that proof in exquisite detail. It can explain it using Shakespearean prose. It can explain it in rhyme and poems. It can, it's just a real pro um, mm-hmm. at understanding and explaining that. If you ask it to prove something that it's never heard, never read about before, even if it's an equally difficult proof, it will be hopeless. And so another kind of dimension we can move along is that initially AI systems are good at problems where there are loads of examples and we can just give it, here's a thousand examples, now just do something similar. And we're able to, whenever we find work with loads of examples, we hand it off. And then over time, okay, it's now better at learning more efficiently. And so we can then hand it problems where we've only got 300 examples, but that's enough. And so we can hand over more of our work and we're now just working on the things that are really novel and that really require our kind of our, our ingenuity. And then, you know, ultimately it progresses all the way so that ultimately AI systems are able to, to make progress on problems with just as few examples as, as a human expert would need. And at that point, again, you know, the human might be mostly just stepping back and kind of, you know, reading, reading the AI's work and, and making sure that it makes sense. Hey, everybody, this is Bob Murphy. Thanks for listening to this clip from the InFi podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, please consider subscribing and share this video with others. We've got new episodes dropping every Friday with more insightful discussions. Stay tuned.